Are you stuck choosing the right brush for watercolour? Let's talk about that and which brush to choose for your particular painting. And of course we'll have to talk about the most important part, watercolour brush strokes for beginners to help you get the most out of whichever brush you choose. I've just received this lovely pack of black tulip brushes from Zen Art Supplies, so we'll also do a painting with them to see how they perform. Stick around to the end if you want to see that. But first, let's talk about what to look for in a watercolour brush. Watercolour painters need short-handled brushes with long, absorbent bristles. The thick consistency of oil and some acrylic paint requires a firm bristle brush, but watercolour is just the opposite. Watercolour painters want a soft brush that soaks up plenty of water and paint, which it easily releases onto the page. The soft bristles in a good watercolour brush then spring back to their original shape once they've released the water and or paint. The material that has ticked all these boxes in days gone by is animal hair. Sable hair, for example, is prized for its ability to keep a fine point. Squirrel is favoured for the amount of water it can hold. Thankfully, these days there are plenty of synthetic alternatives around, like this set from Zen Art Supplies. Synthetic brushes are my first choice. They tend to be cheaper and often more durable than the animal versions. The squirrels are happier with them too, I imagine. Now you'll find that short-handled, soft and springy doesn't really narrow it down a whole lot when you're faced with a wall of brushes to choose from in the art store. So let's see what the different brush shapes can do for us. My go-to brush is always a round, a really big one with a nice sharp point. That's what works best for my style of loose watercolour painting. There are two rounds in this black tulip pack, so let's see what they can do. When you first buy a brush, you might find that the tip doesn't feel soft at all. It feels quite tough and inflexible. Don't be alarmed, it's just that there's a coating on the tips to keep them safe for storage and travel to you. All you need to do is give them a good swish around in the clean water and you'll find that coating washes right off and they're soft and pliable as we expected them to be, especially if we've seen that they've been described as faux squirrel like these black tulip ones. Now perhaps even more important than choosing the right brush for watercolour is being comfortable knowing how to get the most out of it. It really depends on how you hold it and apply it to the paper. With a light touch and using just the tip of the brush perpendicular to the paper, straight up and down, you can get really fine marks. If you reduce the angle so that you're pressing the belly of the brush into the paper, you get a wide mark and a nice large deposit of juicy colour. Or lots of clean water for softening out your mark or making a wash. This set has two rounds, so let's give the smaller round brush a go too. The other thing that you can do with a round brush is to make both the fine and the wide mark in the same brush stroke. All you have to do is vary the pressure. Start with just the tip and then as you make your brush stroke increase the pressure so that you end up pressing the full belly of the brush into the page. Now release the pressure again and you should end up with a narrowing stroke, altogether a rather lovely leaf shape. Let's see what the rigger brush can do. That's the long skinny one. You might also see this brush described as a script or liner brush. Its long bristles give beautiful flexible calligraphic strokes, hence the name script. The tip is very fine so this brush is good for drawing fine lines, hence liner, or the rigging on a ship, hence rigger. Personally, I love the unpredictability of the fine spidery marks that it can make, so I really don't try too hard to control it at all. I love the relaxed whimsy of a loose painting, and this brush makes that easy. Splatter is another lovely way of making marks, and obviously rigger brushes make fine splatter, and larger round brushes would make bigger splatter. Another brush shape that you see is a flat brush. This makes big blocky marks if you use the belly of the brush, but you can also use the tip of the flat edge, pretty much like we did with the round. In this way, you can get a very fine mark similar to the lines we made with the tip of the round. You can also use just a single corner of a flat and get a very nice small mark. The last brush shape in this set is the cat's tongue. This is the one I'm most excited to paint with. 
It's named for its shape, obviously, and just as we've seen with the other brushes, this will make a wide variety of marks depending on how we apply it to the paper. Given its shape, though, we should be able to get an even bigger variety of marks by slightly varying the angles and turning the brushes we paint. I'll show you this a bit more when we do a full painting. So, how many brushes do you need for watercolour? In my opinion, all you really need is one brush. Yes, just one brush is all it takes to paint something. But of course, it's a bit like shoes. We may only need one pair of shoes, but, well, you know what I'm saying. And so it is with brushes. There's a large variety of different brushes, and each shape has its own advantages. But please don't think that you need to go out and get all the different brush shapes when you're just starting out. Start with one round, or even better, a pack like this, with a few shapes to try. Then you'll be able to see which shapes suit your style of painting best. That will help you decide whether or not you need or want to try some of the other shapes. I aim to keep things simple with my painting, by limiting the amount of brushes. After simplicity, my next goal would be to maximise efficiency by choosing the brush that makes life easiest. And this is going to depend on your painting style and subject. For example, if you're painting something that has a lot of straight lines like this with the window frame, a flat brush will do much of the work for you. Of course you can paint these fine straight lines with a round brush, but the width of a flat sets you up for greater success in the straightness of your lines, as it's painting more of the line at once so it's much easier to control. By the way, if you want to paint this painting step by step with me, it's one of the real-time tutorials that are available on my website. I'll pop the link in the description. Here are some other examples of paintings I've done that were made much easier because I chose a flat brush. The big chunky wooden supports in this bridge rail and the planks on the bridge itself were very easy to achieve with the nice square edge of a flat brush. And the bricks in this cottage painting pop in so easily because the flat brush shape is pretty much the shape of the brick. So now let's do a painting with these black tulip brushes. I've got all those watercolour brushes out of the black tulip set ready to use and I'm using a block of uh, cold press watercolour paper and I've taped off the border not because I need to do that to hold the paper down at all it's just that I'm in the mood for a nice clean edge on my painting when I'm done. Now the first thing I'm doing is putting in a nice sort of wash of golden colour which is going to be pretty much the sky uh, that we see through the tree holes in the back so it's pretty much a background and you can see just how soft and flexible these lovely uh, bristles on this cat's tongue brush are. I don't like a flat wash so I want a bit of interest and variety, mottled places and I also want to make sure that this wash kind of drifts out into the um, the other parts of the subject, the hedge, the tree and all of that, so that there's no hard lines, that it's just kind of going to blend. So that big wide brush made fast work of that job and now I'm going to let that dry a little bit as I think about this hedge. So I like to start with a bit of clear water and I haven't changed brush, um, typically I would just use the same brush all the way through but I'm going to try and swap around and I've carefully chosen a subject with something uh, that's a bit square so that we've got a, an, a good opportunity to use the um, the flat brush but right now I'm choosing from my selection of greens and I'm going to try and stick to just this brush so I want to start with the lightest colors at the top because this is a hedge and we've got these little leaves at the top that are catching the light so I'm just dancing the brush around using the tip but kind of pressing the angle and rotating it in my hand as well as I go so that I'm not making the same mark all the time. When you press the brush into the paper it kind of makes a stamp mark uh, and with a brush like this if you keep turning the brush into a slightly different position it's going to stamp a slightly different mark which is exactly what we want when we're painting something like these leaves. So up on the edge, um, where the sunlight is hitting that um, hedge, I've got much finer marks. See, I'm lifting the brush up almost per perpendicular just to paint with a little top to paint those little leaves that are on the edge. 
and then down towards the base where it's all more shadowy I am using more of the belly of the brush um, pressing it down towards the paper a bit more to make a wider efficient mark um, because down there we're not seeing little bits of the edge of leaves catching light we're actually seeing dark shadowy marks and I'm changing the greens that I'm using getting darker and darker as I'm painting the areas that are further and further away from the light. So with the one brush I'm managing to make teeny tiny marks because this the bristles in this particular brush come to such a delightful point that's very easy uh, and I'm also making these big almost like a big flat wash down the bottom uh, where the leaves are all a bit more shadowy. Uh, when I'm painting leaves I'm not thinking I'm painting leaves because if you do that you will probably be trying to paint these sort of cartoon leaf shapes but really we never see a leaf from the same angle so sometimes they look like little lines sometimes they're squashed ovals sometimes they're very round so it's best to just leave it to the brush to come up with a variety of interesting marks that you can put in. And down at the bottom there's at the base of the hedge there's some sort of uh, grassy um, leaves, different leaf shapes that I'm painting there and I'm using again the tip of the brush and flicking it upwards to give the that sort of effect of um, grass spikes but it's exactly the same brush and look at all the different marks we've managed to get out of just that one brush. So it's all rather marvellous and I'm having a, quite a lot of fun painting with this brush. So with that same brush I've swept in a bit of burnt sienna to be the sort of road tracks uh, and I'm going to put in the tree trunk next. Uh, as well as the grass and again I'm just using that same brush uh, and twisting and turning it to get whatever shapes I need for the particular part of the painting. So back to some more leaf shapes uh, with the trees the same way that I did for the hedge. Now let's swap brushes so that we can use the flat to paint the, the, the gate and these fence posts. So my my preference is always for the biggest brush because it's efficient and it also helps if you're trying to be loose. Uh, if you have a small brush you're going to end up tightening up and getting too bogged down in the details but a nice big brush helps you stay loose and expressive. So the side of this post I'm just having a little bit of thought about where the light is catching it so I want to uh, make the best use of that flat edge to put in a nice straight post for the fence uh, and I'm using a paler colour there I think that is yellow ochre and that brush uh, is also helping me put in marks that are very reminiscent of wood it isn't totally even so I want a kind of blotchy um, wash of colour now I'm finding it easier to paint this way because I'm right-handed so instead of making my life difficult and trying to do it um, with the brush at a weird angle I'm just rotating the, the paper. Um, very easy to do that and definitely is going to give you a better chance for success. So I'm rinsing off those uh, the colours from that brush and I'm, I think I'm going to swap to the round here uh, because I need to see how the round is. Um, that overwash was very hard to put down, I must be honest. So I probably would have gone straight back to that. But because we're trying to try out these brushes, I'm opting for one of the smaller rounds to put in some of the darker details at the top of that fence post. So I'm just dropping in um, a Van Dyke brown on that uh, right hand edge just to uh, give the post a little bit more dimension and because the paint's still wet it's all uh, blending together rather beautifully. Now those vertical posts on that little fence um, those would also be best if I do those with the flat brush. So. I did a little bit of changing my mind there. I like to start with a little bit of clean water. So I've popped in a little bit of clean water that will make my colours blend together rather nicely. Uh, and now I need to get my flat brush again and repeat the process I used for the upright post on these uh, horizontals. So you can see how quickly this video is in real time here. See how 
quick and easy it is to put in quite a nice straight line just because the brush is doing most of the work. Okay, let's speed things up again uh, a little bit so that you don't get bored. I'm rotating the page where it makes my life easier to put in those blocky shapes. But now I haven't played with my rigger in this in this particular painting, so let's do that. I'm switching brushes uh, and I'm going to use the fine br bristles on the rigger to put in some of the kind of shadowy highlights. So I'm going for a colour called Moon Glow, which is one of my favourites. It's a kind of a, a dark purpley brown. And um, the fence posts, the, the sort of horizontal ones here, they're quite, they've got rounded edges. So I'm using that rigger to help define those little edges and um, put in the shadows where I think they would be. So that's where those uh, bars cross each other they would kind of be casting shadows on each other and you can see that the way the rigger has got such a fine point makes it very easy to flick in these fine little marks I could really watch these colors blend together all day long it makes me very happy to see these marks kind of soften into the color that's already there uh, and being able to put in just tiny little accents here and there with this rigger does help bring the painting to life Okay, now let's swap back to that nice big flat to put in the, there's kind of, uh, I, I'm guessing it would be a metal sort of gate or railing on the side of this uh, fence post from the reference that I'm, I chose. So the lovely flat brush makes very short work of it. And I'm choosing to start by putting in a nice concentrated uh, line of colour and I don't worry about breaking up the line in fact I try to do that because um, that tends to be more effective and feel a bit more realistic because the light would kind of catch here and there uh, as opposed to making a perfect line and then it looks like a sort of dodgy cartoon so uh, I think breaking up the line is a very helpful thing to do and now with I've cleaned off that brush and I'm just using a little bit of uh, the dampness on the brush to pull the line down to make it slightly wider but it's going to do it with some color variation which is really what I want but what I'm hoping you can see is that the brush is doing most of the work. Okay let's speed things up a bit here so that you can see what it was like when this painting was finished. Um, there's a few little uh, bluebells or something like that uh, and I'm just swapping between the various brushes. Uh, as you can see I could probably have done the whole thing with that gorgeous cat's tongue brush but it's just a case of matching the brush to the job that you want doing. So fine whippy marks are best with the tip of a round or a rigger for particularly flexible expressive marks. Marks, uh, and big loose marks are better with a wider brush so now we're at the stage where I'm really just enjoying painting uh, and that's usually quite a dangerous time because you need to stop um, and those last minute details like the grass are really fun to put in uh, but you have to remind yourself that you're in danger of overworking it and now we've got to the fun part. Um, the whole reason I went to the bother of taping things up in the first place is so that we can do this tape reveal, which is by far the best part of the painting. Uh, and if you like your painting, then it can be a nerve wracking moment because you don't want to rip it and you could see my reticence there. But the wise thing to do is to pull the tape away from your painting so that if any paper does kind of lift off, which hopefully it won't if you use painter's tape uh, or artist's tape, um, and if you're tearing the tape away from the painting, hopefully any tears would go away from the painting rather than into it. Uh, and I'm always quite surprised uh, what a difference it makes to the whole image uh, when you see it with a nice clean border. So one bit to go and we're all done. I hope you had a lot of fun watching this and that you feel confident about choosing uh, the right brush for the job and what to do with it when you've actually chosen the one you think is going to suit you. If you're looking for a few more details don't forget to check the description for links to blog posts, tutorials and these lovely brushes. Happy painting!